Amen? Amen. And so uh, I want you to be turning your Bibles to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel is the Old Testament. It's right after 1 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 9. That's what we're going to be looking at first. Uh, actually, we're going to read the entire chapter. It's not that long. 2 Samuel chapter 9. But before I do that, let me just tell you how thankful I am to be able to be a part of this church this week, this weekend rather. And, and does it is it just me or does it just seem like I just rolled in here? I mean, this weekend has flown by, hasn't it? Amen. I did my best to try to preach as long and hard as I could, and it's still flown by. Amen. Amen. And uh, y'all have been so gracious, and I mean, even if you didn't like it, some of y'all acted like you did. You fooled me. Amen. Amen. And I appreciate that. And, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, I believe that God's really done some things, and I told Brother Jonathan last night after the message, you know, that message last night is tough. That's a tough word to deal with, and a lot of times... It takes a while, a while to digest some of that, amen, to allow the Holy Spirit to, to take that word in part to uh, uh, move in your heart to allow that change to take place. So I'm looking forward to what's going to happen in the days and weeks to come, amen. Because I'm just one of those guys that is a firm believer that the Holy Spirit's much better at getting people to do things than preachers are. And whenever He does it, it's a lasting effect. It's an eternal work that the Holy Spirit does. So I'm looking forward to what He's going to do as a result of this week, as a result of your faithfulness. I mean, uh, not many people are willing to give up Friday nights and Saturday nights to come hear a preacher yell and scream at them. Amen? Amen. But you did. And so I pray that God bless you for that. Thank you so much for your faithfulness, for, your, uh, for the offering, for the food. And I just got to tell you, I will go back to Louisiana with a story that I have never had from any revival I've ever been at before. Amen? I will go back and share with them how I was talked into eating a mullet gizzard. <laughs> and I will not speak kindly of that experience. Amen? <laughs> Well, all right. So anyway, thank you. I love you all. Thank you, Brother Jonathan, for inviting me to come. And uh, man, let's just see what God's going to do today. Amen. I, I, hey, I, I don't want to say that's from the man that eats crawfish, though. What's that, brother? I said that's from a man that eats crawfish. Uh, that crawfish slides <laughs> down a lot better than that gizzard is. I can tell you that. <laughs> well, I don't want us to think it's over because we still got a service here. Amen. We still hey, got man. a word. So let's get excited about what God's going to show us. Here this morning. Let's read 2 Samuel chapter 9. Here's what the Bible says. And David said, Is there any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Is there, and, and there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when he had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show kindness, uh, the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame in his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in, uh, uh, in the house of Mashir, the son of a mule, in Lodabar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Mashir and the son of a mule, from Lodabar. And now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all of the land of Saul thy father, and, they, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called unto Ziba, Saul's servant, said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertained unto Saul and all to his house. Now therefore thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him and shall bring him in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread always at my table." Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, According to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, 
so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and he and all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in, in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was laid on both his feet. Father, thank you so much for your beautiful word this morning. God, how I pray that you will illuminate our hearts today with this word. God, how I pray that you will give us a picture of us today. God, that you'll demonstrate to us through your word through this Old Testament story. God, of what you do to every person who will come in faith to Jesus Christ. So God, as, uh, as we share this, God, I pray that you might move in power in this place this morning. God, if there be anybody here who has never before trusted you, never before experienced salvation through Jesus Christ, never before been changed by the power of God, I pray this morning is the day that, Lord, they are transformed into a new creation. God, where you turn them upside down and inside out. God, that you put a new heart in them, Lord. They become your children this morning. So God, do what only you can do today. And we'll give you glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to tell you what. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about this message. Amen. Man, I've been, God put this on my heart last night and all day long I've been thinking about it and rereading this passage. And every time I read this passage, I get excited. About three or four months ago, I was listening to the radio driving down the road and I heard someone mention this guy by the name of a fitnessship. And I thought, man, I heard just a little bit about his story. So I went home and I began to research this out. And man, the story of Mephibosheth is one of the most exciting stories in all the Old Testament and all the Bible because it gives us a picture. Ladies and gentlemen, this story that we read this morning is an Old Testament picture of New Testament grace. Woo! Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to see that what we see in the story and the life of Mephibosheth is what happens to you and I and anybody who will call upon the Lord for salvation. It's a story of grace. It's a story of unbelievable grace. It's a story of amazing grace. Now, what is grace? Well, Webster defines grace as undeserved divine assistance given to humans for their regeneration and sanctification. I know you didn't get that, so let me give you another one. <laughs> Others have defined it as unmerited divine love and favor extended to sinners. That's pretty good, amen? amen? And maybe you've heard the following. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And grace is getting what you do not deserve. Woo! And in Jesus, we get mercy and grace. Amen? We don't get what we deserve, and we get what we don't deserve. That's right. Amen. Are y'all getting that this morning? I want you to understand that as a child of God, you have received something that you didn't earn, that you don't deserve. You become a child of God, and you did nothing to attain that. God gave it to you. That's grace. So this chapter is all about grace. It's all about God's amazing grace. How the grace of God reaches down to the undeserving. How it reaches down to the hurting, to the fallen, to the sick, to the lost, to the sinners, and He lifts them up and puts them in a place that they do not deserve. Puts them in a place of royalty. Even though they deserve hell. Even though I deserve hell, I want you to know you're looking at royalty this morning. Amen. Amen. Even though I'm a wicked guy, even though I want you to know that my sin has separated me from God this morning, I am a child of God. I am royalty. I know I don't look like it, but I am. Amen. I know I don't dress like it, but I am. Inside of me is a heart that beats royalty. Amen. So here we go. Listen, a picture of God's grace. And listen, nothing, nothing. But the grace of God can bring salvation. Turn over real quick to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read two verses out of that as we get started in this. Listen, I've only got four points this morning. It's going to be real quick. Amen? 
It is going to be real quick. Amen. Now you listen fast and we'll get out of here fast. Here's what Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 says. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. Ladies and gentlemen, grace, salvation is a work of God. You can't work your way to salvation. You can't give enough to get saved. You can't do enough to get saved. The Bible says that the very best that you have to offer is as filthy rags to God. I wouldn't trust the best 15 minutes of my life to get me to heaven. I wouldn't. Because even in the best 15 minutes of my life, I've blown it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's all because of grace. You can't work with it. That's the reason you can't come to church enough to go to heaven. It's not about going to church. It's not about church membership. It's not even about being baptized. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you've never come to Jesus on His terms, then I want you to know that you've never come to Jesus at all. So here we go. Now, this is an Old Testament picture, as I said, of a New Testament grace. And so here we have the story of Jonathan's son. Jonathan, as you know, was King Saul's son. So Mephibosheth is Jonathan's son, which, is, uh, which would make uh, Saul uh, Mephibosheth's grandfather. Are you following me? King Saul, and I'm not going to take a long time going, you can go back and research all this out. But King Saul was the one who was king over Israel, and then he had a son, Jonathan, then David came into the picture through a long series of events, and then there became that strife, and that uh, King Saul become uh, uh, angry at David and tried killing him, and there become this battle. But in the middle of all of that, Jonathan and David become blood brothers. They did. Amen. They committed a, a blood covenant to one another. They become blood brothers and they had this covenant to one another where they would love one another and help one another for the rest of their life despite the fact that King Saul was trying to kill David. And throughout all of these things, King David held to the promise that he made to Jonathan that he would always be there for him. They would always take care of him and all of his descendants. Well, as you all know in the story of, of this uh, saga here, King Saul and his son Jonathan were killed. During the process of them being killed, Mephibosheth, who was being cared for at a nurse in another location away from the battle, away from the conflict, heard that King Saul and David had been killed. And so in the haste and the turmoil and the, and the conflict of, of everything going on, the nurse grabs up Mephibosheth and they take off running, the Bible says. And they're running for their lives, trying to get somewhere out of danger to save the life of Mephibosheth. And in the process, the Bible says that Mephibosheth, when he was five years old, running for his life, fell. It says whenever he fell, he became lame in both of his feet. Now the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how he was lame. He could have been paralyzed. He could have broken both ankles and never walked the same again. He could have broken both legs. But it is very clear throughout Scripture that Mephibosheth was a crippled boy. He was a crippled man. He was lame in both of his feet. Now that's important as we continue on. So here we go, my four points. Are you ready? I, that was the porch. Now I'm getting in the house. Here we go. Four points this morning. Then we're done. Then we'll go. Y'all can go eat all the little <coughs> mullets you want to. Amen. <laughs> now, my first point that I want you to see about the fellowship is that he was separated. He was separated. Now listen, the Bible says in verse 4 that, that whenever King David asked where he was at, he said, well, that he's living down there in Lodabar. He's living way down there in Lodabar. Now if you look up where Lodabar was, you'll find that Lodabar was the scum of the earth. Lodabar was the, was the ghetto of the day. It was the place where the nobodies lived. It was the place where the beggars lived. You see, Mephibosheth, listen, who was in line for the kingdom at one point, was now reduced to nothing but a beggar. He couldn't work. He couldn't be active in society. He was living hid out in some little rickety shack somewhere, trying to hide from King David, who he thought was trying to kill him. He was hid out there, trying to be incognito, and he was reduced to living the life of a beggar. He had nothing. He had no possessions. He had nothing. He 
had to beg for food to eat. Him and his family. I want you to realize that he was separated from the king. He was separated from the kingdom. Oh, not only that, but Mephibosheth, if you look at verse 8, he refers to himself whenever he finally meets King David, he refers to himself as a dead dog. Amen. Now listen, there are a lot of things that you can call yourself back in that culture that was low, and that was one of the lowest things you could call yourself, a dead dog. He considered himself the worst of the worst. Can I tell you something here this morning, ladies and gentlemen? You can never get saved until you realize you're just like Mephibosheth. Right. You can never experience the grace of Jesus until you realize that you're the lowest of the low. Until you realize that you're the worst sinner of them all. Mephibosheth was separated. Listen, physically he could do nothing. He was worthless in the world's eyes. And not only that, he was worthless in his eyes. I know a lot of people like that. They think they're worthless in the world's eyes. And you get to talking to them and you realize they consider them own selves worthless. Perhaps even you're here this morning and you think your life is worthless. There's no hope, no peace, no purpose. And you are a prime candidate to experience the grace of Jesus today. Because He doesn't look at you as worthless. He doesn't look at you as hopeless. He doesn't look at you the way that you look at yourself. He looks at you with the love of all of eternity. Because He loved you enough to die for you. You're worthless. To, you're worth something to Jesus. So He was separated from the new king. He remained in fear from hiding because He was afraid that if the king found out where he was at, that he would come and kill him, right? Right? Listen, today every sinner is in that same position as Mephibosheth. We are separated from God. We are separated from God because of our sin. Listen, we're separated from God and we deserve the punishment that God has established for those who are separated from Him. Listen, the Bible makes it very clear that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Listen, don't ever think that you can live good enough or do enough good to get the favor of God because the very best that you have is not good enough. The very best that you have is filth according to God. You cannot live good enough to get the favor of God. In fact, the Bible says in Isaiah 59 verse 2, it says that our iniquities have separated between us and God. And the Bible says in Ezekiel 18 chapter 18 verse 4, that our sin is as unclean as filthy rags. And then in Romans 6, 23, the Bible says that the wages of that sin is death. I get a chance to talk to a lot of people. And one of the things that I hear every so often is this statement. Well, I just don't believe that a loving God will send someone to hell. And you know what I always say? I always say this. You're exactly right. You are going to send your own self to hell. Yes. Because at that time and that moment when those books are open, He's going to reveal to you your sin. And He's going to reveal to you why you deserve the wages that you have lived your life for. You live your life for sin, you're going to experience the payment of that sin. Death and hell. So our iniquities have separated from us. Our sins have separated us from God. We can't get to God, but God knew that. That's what I love about it. Amen. Amen. Listen, we can't get to God. There's nothing that we can do to get the favor of God. We can't get to God, but God knew that. And that's the reason the Bible says that from the very foundation of the world, Jesus was the Lamb that was to be slain. He knew that we couldn't get to Him, so He came to us. Jesus left glory and He came to this earth. He lived that perfect sinless life. He died upon that cross. He endured our hell on that cross so that we wouldn't have to. And then three days later after He was buried, He rose from the dead, ensuring us victory over death, hell, and the grave. And now we can't get to God, but God got to us. And if we'll go through Jesus, we get access to God. Amen. So we see that Mephibosheth was separated. And the second point is, I want you to see that Mephibosheth was sought. 
I'm going to get excited while it's over with, amen. <laughs> but Phibosheth was salt. Look in verses 1 through 5, and you'll see where King David, he actively went out. He began to put things into motion. He was seeking Mephibosheth. He was looking for Mephibosheth. Where's Mephibosheth? we got to find him. Spare no expense. And I want you to get all the soldiers. Get everybody involved. We're going to search the world until we find Mephibosheth. Listen, he said he wanted to find him to show him kindness. Amen. David sought him out. And here's what blows my mind. Here's what blows my mind. The entire time that King David had all those men searching the countryside, trying to find Mephibosheth. The entire time while they were searching through every home in Lodabar. The entire time they were looking for Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth was hiding. Because he was scared for his life. You see, he was hiding from King David. And King David was looking for him to help him. To show him kindness. Isn't that just like us today? We're sinners. We're separated from God. And we do our best to hide from God. We do everything we can to, to stay away from God, please. Stay away from people who are godly. Because it convicts us. We do our best to hide from God, but the entire time we're hiding from God, God is looking for us. Remember in the Garden of Eden whenever Adam and Eve sinned? And the Bible says that they sowed fig leaves together, and then God come into the garden looking for them, and the Bible says that they were hiding. And he says, Adam, where are you? And he come out and he said, we were hiding. And the whole time they were hiding, God was looking for them. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't care where you're at today. I don't care what state you're at today. I don't care where you're hiding. God is looking for you this morning. He's searching for you right now. He wants to save you. He wants to deliver you. He wants to change your life. How does He do that? Well, first of all, I want you to know He seeks us by sending His Son to die for us. Amen. The Bible says in John 3.16, you all know this, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He seeks us by sending His Son, amen, to die for us. Listen, John uh, chapter 10, verse 11 says, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd who gives His life for His sheep. He came to die seeking for you. Not only that, but He sends the Holy Spirit to convict sinners. He sent His Son, then He sent the Holy Spirit to convict sinners. The Bible says in John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11, that the Holy Spirit was sent to reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. You understand that God loves you so much that not only did He send Jesus to die on the cross for you, but He sent the Holy Ghost of God to come down here, to come right here at Eastside Baptist Church to speak to your heart, to draw you to salvation in Jesus. What an honor. Not only does he send his son, did he send the son, and not only did he send the Holy Ghost, but I want you to know he sends the church to reach those who are hiding in Lodabar. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15, the Bible says that the church is to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, we are commissioned as a body of believers to not be pew sinners, but to be active members of the commission of God to go out and to seek and save and to find those that are hiding way down in Lodabar tell about Jesus. Listen, I want to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. If this church here is not actively involved in outreach and telling people about Jesus, then you've missed the whole purpose of why you're here. If you're not actively involved in mission work, if you're not actively involved in telling people about Jesus, then you've missed the whole point of why you're here. This is not a country club. This is not some uh, little uh, 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 carousel thing, some little fair. This is not some little group meeting. Amen. This is not a civic club or anything else. This is a soldier outfit. Amen. And you've been commissioned by God to get outside of this church and to go to Lodabar and to reach those who are hiding from God to tell them the glorious good news that Jesus loves them. Well, not only was he separated, not only was he sought, but then he was saved. 
Y'all not have much fun as I am, I can tell you, amen. <laughs> he will say, listen, verses 6 through 13 talks about how David went and got him and delivered him out of Lodabar and brought him to the king's palace there in Jerusalem. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand that Mephibosheth was saved from a miserable life and he was given his inheritance. Amen? He did nothing to earn it. He was given to him freely. Are you hearing me tonight? Listen, uh, this morning, he did nothing to earn the favor of David. It was given to him freely. And I want you to know as sinners, as lost people, men, women, boys and girls here today, you have done nothing to earn salvation in Christ. It is offered to you freely today. Freely. You can't pay for it. You can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't work it all. It's offered to you freely. The best way that I know to describe that, listen, is to give an illustration. Now, who was it that come to me last night? Brother, that was you come up and gave me a compliment, wasn't it, at the, at the eat? Come up here, brother. I want you to come help me with this. Now, when I stay this thing. Stand up right there so everybody can see you. And unless you're taller, baby, then I don't. <laughs> now, what's your name, bud? Isaiah. Isaiah, that's a good name. Huh? Isaiah, don't fall, amen. Now, Isaiah, he kind of. Sir? All right, good. Now, Isaiah, he, he was kind of nice to me there yesterday. He said some kind of things, so I already like Isaiah, amen. Now, Isaiah, here's what I want you to do. Now, we're going to give an illustration here right now. We're gonna, let me get up here where I'll be a little taller. Here. Now, we're, we're going to do a little illustration so we can demonstrate what salvation is, okay? Are you ready? Are you going to help me out with this? Good. Now, here's what salvation is. Salvation, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. And the second part of that is, but the free gift of God is what? Eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So the Bible describes salvation as a free gift. Now, do you know what a gift is, Isaiah? Yeah. What is it? When somebody gives somebody to someone else. When somebody gives something to somebody else. Very good. So let's just no, stay right there. Now let's just say, for instance, Isaiah, that I had this $5 bill. Now, I know that won't get you much these days, but $5, still $5, it might get you a snow cone or something. Amen. That's $5, right? Now, let's just say Isaiah. Look, that's Chris. I love $5 bill. Don't kiss Don't All right, so let's just say I got $5 right here. Now, Isaiah, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to offer you this $5 as a gift. This is my gift to you, Isaiah. Isaiah, this $5 is my gift to you. Isaiah, I want you to understand that you didn't work for this $5. You did nothing to get this $5. I'm just going to give you this $5. This $5 bill, Isaiah, is yours. It will cost you nothing. You don't have to say anything nice about it. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything to earn this $5. This $5 is a gift. Are you ready? Now, here's what you have to do. All you have to do is receive the gift. So here's the gift. Now, what I want to do is I'm going to give you this $5. This is my gift to you, Isaiah. Not that you don't have to do anything. This is my gift to you, Isaiah. You're welcome. Now, go sit down. Good job. Give me a hand. Amen. Here's the deal about a gift. I could stand there all day long holding that $5 in front of Isaiah. And it is a gift. But it's not Isaiah's until he reached out and took the gift. And I want you to understand, a lot of you, you've sat through service after service, and God has extended the gift of salvation to you, and you've refused. Listen to me, my dear friend. God's not going to beat you over the head. He's not going to force you onto your knees. Listen to me. He wants you to come willingly to Him. He wants you to accept the free gift that He offers of salvation. Well, and finally, not only was he separated, not only was he sought, not only was he saved, but he was given sonship. In verses 7 and verse 13, you read where King David gave Mephibosheth a place in the palace, and he made the statement that from that day forward, Mephibosheth would eat every meal at the king's table. Can I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, this morning? that only the king's sons could sit at the king's table. In fact, the Bible says that King David made a note that from that day on, Mephibosheth would be as one of the king's 
sons. I want you to know, my dear friends, that he was adopted into royalty that day. He was made a son of the king, even though he didn't deserve it. From that day forward, he would eat at the table of the king. Listen to me, that's exactly what happens to a person who comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to what the Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Ladies and gentlemen, whenever you come and receive that free gift of salvation at that moment, at that instant, you become a child of the King. You become royalty. Amen. Woo! Listen, Mephibosheth was a nobody who became a somebody when he got out of the King's table. Woo! But see, Mephibosheth was a beggar. He was a cripple boy. He was useless. He was worthless. But all of a sudden, he had word. He had substance. And he was a child of the King. And I want you to know that he offers that to you today. He offers that to you today. You know what I love about this story? I love about this, the wording that it has there in the, in the scriptures that we read when it talked about that uh, Mephibosheth would dine at the king's table. Listen to my dear friend. I want you to understand that whenever Mephibosheth, that poor crippled man, sat at the king's table, no one could see his crippled legs anymore. See, what that means to us, my dear friends, is, is that we're crippled by sin. But I want you to know that crippledness of sin is cleansed by the blood of Jesus. That's right. I want you to know that the deformity of our sin is covered by the righteousness of Jesus. Whenever we come to Christ, He changes us. No longer are we, are we deformed. No longer are we crippled. We become a new creation in Jesus Christ. So I ask you, Mephibosheth was no longer a beggar. He was no longer a poor, crippled boy. He was royalty. Are you royalty today? Has there been a time in your life whenever your life was completely changed by Jesus? Or are you still playing church? You still just show up every once in a while, come to church, call, check off. Maybe you come. Maybe check off on Sundays. Hey, I went to church. I did my duty today. Or has there ever been a time in your life whenever Jesus totally transformed your life? Here's what I understand about Scripture. Whenever God moves on an individual, whenever someone comes to Jesus, they are forever changed from that moment on. You see, my dear friend, I believe that whenever God saves someone, He saves them completely. And they have a new way of thinking and a new way of talking and a new way of walking. Everything about them is different, my dear friends. Everything about that person is different whenever they have an encounter with Jesus Christ. You can't help it. He changes every fiber of your being. Listen, I, I'll tell you, I've seen it happen before. I've seen an old boy that never been to church before in his life. Hear about Jesus, somebody share Christ with him. He get gloriously born again. He knows nothing about what to do and automatically starts to clean himself up. Nobody's told him he's got to stop doing these things. He just automatically starts doing it. Why? Because he's been changed from the inside out. Amen. And what happens a lot of times in our churches, we conform rather than get converted. Amen, brother. We know how to act and the right things to say and the right things to do. And we know how to look the part. So we come to church acting like we got it all together, but inside the walls, we've never been changed by Jesus. And we wonder why so many church members are out doing the things they're doing. They claim to be Christians, but they're living like lost people. And the truth is, they probably are lost. Brother Craig, that's a mighty hard statement. Yes, but I'm going to tell you something. In the book of James, you realize that James was much harsher than I am. He said, you talk all you want to. Show me. Amen. Show me your works. 
Now, I already told you, salvation is by grace. It's given. You don't work for it, but I'm going to tell you what. When you are saved, you'll be working. Amen. You'll have evidence to back up. So don't try to tell me, Brother Craig, I remember that night, man. Goose pimples was, was all over my body. Freckles were swapping arms. And, man, my hair was sticking up everywhere. Oh, I had a great experience with Jesus. But there's never been any change in your life. You still do the same things. You still go to the same places. You still talk the same. You still watch the same junk on TV. Go to the same movie houses. You still do all the things that you used to do before your experience, but now you claim you had an experience. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that the devil's real good about manufacturing experiences. Amen. Even in churches. He'll do anything he can to deceive you. <coughs> And I want you to know, my dear friends, I can have all kinds of experiences. Every time I hear the national anthem played, I can have an experience. Amen? Listen, you can have an experience in a bar. Not anything real Holy Ghost spiritual about it, but you can have an experience in there. Amen? Amen? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to know, has there ever been a time when Jesus changed your life? To where you've gone from the life of Lodabar to sitting at the king's table. Because if you haven't, today's the day. Because that's exactly how I used to be. See, I haven't shared my testimony with y'all, but I'm going to tell you for 25 years, everybody that knew me thought I was a Christian. I was big in the church. I, 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 listen, I was going to church before I was born. I, I grew up in church. I was at church every time the doors opened. When I was seven years of age, I walked down the aisle after a sermon. The preacher met me down there. He told me to go have a seat on the front row. I sat down on the front row. A nice little lady come sit down there beside me. I filled out a card. And as soon as they finished the 14th verse of Just As I Am, the preacher brought me back up there and announced to everybody, Craig Franklin got saved today. We're going to baptize him in two weeks. I never repented. I never called upon Jesus. I never had my life transformed. And yet here I was in two weeks going through the baptistry. And from that point on, everybody said that I was saved. And I just started fitting in with everybody else. Can I tell you something, ladies and gentlemen? For 25 years, I played church. For 25 years, I played Christian. I was sincere about what I was doing. But I was sincerely wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, I was sincere. Listen, I was on staff at churches. I was a youth director for years. I was a music director for years. In fact, I was a music director whenever I was leading a revival one night at a worship at a revival service, and the preacher preached a message on what are you depending upon for your salvation? And he read a passage of scripture, Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, where there's, there's these people standing before Jesus on the day of judgment. And Jesus looks and they begin telling all these reasons why they should be led into heaven. And Jesus looks at them and says, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. And it was at that moment that the Holy Ghost of God got a hold of me and showed me that I was lost. That I was depending upon all my church work. That I was depending upon all these things that I was doing. Because listen to me, my dear friend. I may have looked like I had it all together standing up in church. But listen, the church people couldn't see what I was doing in the darkness. Because the one thing that church taught me in 25 years was how to hide my sin. Because church people are real good at hiding their sin. Y'all need me in that. <laughs> And it taught me how to hide my sin. So I was real good about doing things when nobody else was looking. But that night, God got a hold of me. I went home and I began to pray, Oh, God, am I lost? Am I really lost? Am I really lost? I couldn't sleep any that night. The next morning, I got up and I went to have lunch. I was at Sonic Drive-In. Me and the evangelists, and we're sitting there at Sonic Drive-In. We'd ordered the brown bag special. And he knew God was dealing with me. And he said, Craig, did God ever show you What's going on in your life? And I said, yes, sir. He showed me I was lost. He showed me that if I was to die right now, I'd spend eternity in hell. And he said, well, Greg, all you have to do is call upon Jesus. Repent of your sin and He'll save you. He'll change you. And right there at 11.07 in 1994, on a Friday morning, while I was waiting on a brown bag special to arrive, I bowed my head in the cab of that pickup truck. And I cried out to God, Oh, God, have mercy on me. Please, dear God, save my soul. And right there, Sonic 
crowd. Jesus changed my life, friend. Amen. I want you to know something that's been different ever since. Can I tell you something? There really is something real about meeting Jesus. He changes you, my dear friend. It's more than just coming to church. It's more than just religious activity. It's something that really occurs in your life and changes you. I was 25 years of age at that time. And I want you to know from that time to today, I've never once doubted what God did for me. Listen, listen, all, I'm trying to tell you, all my religious stuff's out the window anymore. Amen? I'm not dependent upon my religion. I'm not dependent upon going to church. I'm not dependent upon giving money. I'm depending upon one thing, and that is the grace of God that was extended to me that day at Sonic Drive. That changed my life. So I want to ask you this morning, has the grace of God ever changed you? I'm not asking you if you've ever joined a church or been baptized. I'm not even asking you if you've had some kind of experience. I'm asking you, has Jesus really ever changed your life? Because friends, you know if he has or if he hasn't. You know. You know what else? Your family knows. Your family knows. I used to say you could fool everybody. You could fool your preacher and you could fool your kid folk and church members and all that stuff. That's before I got married. <laughs> you see, the truth of the matter is your husband or your wife knows how you really are. They see you 24 hours a day. They see you all the time. In fact, they could probably stand up and testify right now whether or not you're a true follower of Jesus, whether you've ever been changed by Jesus. Parents, can I tell you something? Your kids know. Smartest group of people on the planet is your children. They know a whole lot more than you think they know. They see the way you act and react. They see what you do at house when the preacher's not around. They know you. So I want to ask you again, has there ever been a time whenever Jesus reached down and got you at a low bar and set you at the king's table? The grace is offered to you this morning. Would you bow your heads? I want you to be still, and I want you to be very honest this morning. I believe with all of my heart that God has put his finger on somebody in this place today. Maybe for the first time in your life. Maybe you've been doing it for a long time. But this morning, the Holy Ghost of God has gripped your heart. He has shown you that you've never truly been born again. You've never truly been changed by Jesus. Maybe you've been playing church like me for a long time. Maybe everybody in this church thinks you're saved. But you know in your heart that you have never truly experience salvation through Christ. So I don't want anybody looking around. But I'm going to ask you to do something. Now I don't embarrass people. I don't come to get people. That's not my deal. Here's what I do. I pray for people. And I want to ask you to be honest this morning because I want to pray for you. If you're here this morning you have never before experienced salvation through Christ, You've never had your life changed for Jesus. I'm going to ask for you just to slip your hand up real quick. And I want to pray for you. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. Anybody else? Amen. Amen. Anybody else? I'm just going to pray for you. That's it. I told you I don't embarrass people. I don't come get people. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to call you name or anything. I'm just going to pray for you. Anybody else? Amen. I see you, buddy. Anybody else? I've never been changed like what you described today, preacher. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to pray for you. I'm a man of my word and I'm about to pray for you as hard as I know how to pray. Can I tell you something? Just as I offered that five dollar bill to Isaiah, <coughs> Isaiah, as I offered that money to Isaiah, by you sitting there this morning, and raising your hand and acknowledging that you have never been changed, that you need salvation through Jesus, 
while that is a great first step and a needed first step, you still have to accept the gift. So what I'm going to do, as soon as we get through, as soon as I get through praying, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. Brother Jonathan's going to be standing right down here in front. And if God has spoken to you about being saved this morning, and I'm going to ask for you to get up out of your pew and come down here and tell Brother John, I need to be saved. I need Jesus to change me today. Some of you have been in love bar for a long time. And the weight is heavy. And God's offering you relief today through Jesus. Father, I thank you so much. God, I thank you for how you are moving in this place right now. God, how you are speaking to hearts and how you are drawing people to you. God, I pray with all of my heart, Lord, that those that raised their hands and possibly one or two that didn't raise their hand, God, that they will realize they need you today, that they will come running to this altar to experience the grace of God that you offer them. God, that they won't be embarrassed or ashamed, that they won't let pride get in their way, that they won't let the devil talk them out of it, but God, that they will be committed to come and trust in you today to forever be changed. Father, I pray for everybody that raised their hand, Lord, that you would give them the faith and the strength and the courage to step out, to accept the free gift that you offer them. In Jesus' name, Amen. Would you stand to your feet? I'm just going to ask for you to keep your heads bowed. Our sister's going to play on the piano.